Hello and welcome to the Categorically Romance podcast. I'm Aaron. And I'm Bree. And today on the podcast, we are joined by writer, editor, teacher, and consultant, Rachel Kramer Bussell. Rachel, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Tell our listeners a little about yourself. Okay, thank you for having me. I am an erotica author and editor. I'm I'm an avid reader. I don't know if that's in my official bio, but you know, I love books. Uh, kind of feel like I got into books so that I could afford to buy more books. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I've been writing erotica since 1999, but that I kind of fell into it. I had written nonfiction before that, and I started. Uh, writing one short story that led to more short stories that led to editing anthologies. So I've been editing anthologies since 2004. And in that time, I've edited over 70 of them. And uh, some of them have themes like spanking or bondage or oral sex. And then some have no theme or the theme is pretty broad. And then I also As part of that, edit the Best Women's Erotica of the Year series, which is an annual series from Cleus Press that comes out every December and has around 20 to 25 short stories uh, by authors all around the world, all of whom identify as women or genderqueer or gender nonconforming. And uh, I really love working on that. And I've published authors from, I don't know how many countries, but many, many countries, because I send the author copies out. So I've sent them to Japan and Australia and France and Spain and all over. I I love doing that. Uh, And then I also teach erotica writing workshops. I've done it in person. These days I do it mostly online. And that's really fun that I also have had a lot of international people taking my classes. And I, I really enjoy that because I think people who have the inkling to write erotica kind of know that they want to do it, but they need a lot of encouragement. So I love giving them that encouragement and advice. And I have a new book out called How to Write Erotica, which is a nonfiction writing guide that inspired by my in-person classes, but expands on them and has writing prompts. And it has interviews with a lot of authors who are self-published and traditionally published and advice and hopefully everything you need to know to get started. I swear this is just the coolest thing ever. (laughs) Thank you. Well, let's get into some icebreakers. If you came with a warning label, what would it say? I would definitely say that I'm a little frazzled, as you both probably know, because I I told uh, Bri and Aaron that I was running two minutes late, which I was, and then I went to log into this, and I was like, where's the URL to log in? I couldn't (laughs) find it, because I I have to label everything in my inbox. Like I usually label it Zoom, but I had not labeled it Zoom. So I'm often a little frazzled. I don't know if I appear that way online, but sometimes people say to me, oh, you're so organized. And I'm like, okay, well, that is a good illusion. In my head, (laughs) I'm not that organized or I have to be hyper organized. I have to write lots of to-do lists and remind myself of a lot of things to keep track of all the projects because I I love being busy, but then sometimes I get super busy and I get frazzled. I mean, I have systems. I have, like, everything has its own folder. Everything has its own email address. Like, every project has its own systems. Otherwise, there would be no way I would remember everything because, I, you know, a lot of my work is sending emails. You know, for each book, there's dozens of emails for each class. So I try to keep myself on track of which thing I'm emailing. And then it gets extra confusing because a lot of the authors, most of them I work with have pseudonym. So sometimes they're emailing me from one name. Oh my gosh. You know, you know yeah. in my inbox it appears as one name, but then the name they're publishing with is another name. And sometimes <laughs> that changes, like they submit under one name and then they change it later. And then, you know, I have to be very careful about keeping track of that to make sure that the pseudonym is what ends up in the book, which, which it always does. But, you know, that's something I will say, like if you're submitting work to me and you want it to be published under, you know, Jane Doe, always write like by Jane Doe at the top of your manuscript. Don't write by Lisa Smith because then I'll, I might be liable to write by Lisa Smith in my, you know, in the manuscript and, you know, everyone makes mistakes. So if, if that gets into that, usually it would be caught and it, I've never, this has never happened. I don't want anyone to think, Oh, if I submit my work to Rachel, she's going to publish my real name. 
it's just something that's like one of the many things I keep track of. Yeah. Well, tell us three songs that would be on the mixtape to your life and what they say about you. Okay. Uh, I would say there's a song by the singer Kim Ritchie called Can't Lose Them All that I really like. And it's basically about how even if you face rejection, you just have to keep going. And I think that's that's true for any writer, um, certainly myself. Uh, I think sometimes people get really discouraged when they get rejections. And of course, that's natural. I get discouraged too, or I get I get disappointed. But some of the things that I've written that I'm most proud of got rejected multiple times before they found a home. So I like that song. Um, I like Holiday by Madonna because I'm old school. I'm a child of the 80s. Uh, I just think it's fun and celebratory. And uh, I would say Hello by Adele because I'm definitely a sappy, romantic person. I have the word heart tattooed on my arm. And so actually kind of all of Adele's music, but that one especially, it always reminds me of certain exes and um, not that I'm hung up on them, but I think like there's certain exes where I feel like there's always going to be like that little moment of like, what if? What if, yeah. I think everybody's life mixtape should have at least one Adele song. <laughs> She's so good at that kind of song. And you're like, wow. And then it makes you think like, is Adele just constantly pining away all day? <laughs> Share with us one of your most read authors. Uh, for me, that would be Katrina Jackson. I admit I have not read her entire work. Sometimes I save like a favorite author. Like I save some of their work for when I really want to binge or you know, really dive even deeper. But I love everything I've read of hers. I've published several of her short stories. I've read her um, erotic romances and erotic novels. And I feel like I am not the dark romance, like mafia romance reader. I don't tend to read that, but she got me into her mafia romances. And I'm like, these are so good. And yet, you know, these people are, are killing people, but then they're so sexy. And there's a love story and I, I don't know. I just, I've read other work of hers too. And I just think she has such a great way of exploring eroticism within romance. And there's just such tension and amazing sex scenes and characters that, that feel real, you know, whether yeah. they're a, an academic or a mafia person or, you know, a spy or whoever they are. So I love her writing and uh, I always look forward to her new book. Yeah, I think there's something special about also just knowing that you still have a couple titles by a favorite author for like just in case purposes. You like you you've saved them. Like I haven't read any like everything by them yet. You know, like because there's you don't want to have to like one of the crazy things is like having a favorite author and like having to wait on the next book. It's like I still have like one or two titles that I I've saved for moments like this. And I think Katrina Jackson is fantastic. She's like anything I've ever heard her like speak on. I'm like, she's just so smart. Like I want to be friends with that woman. <laughs> she's she did just... a book club during the pandemic, like in 20, I think it was 2020. She did this great book club and I was introduced to lots of new authors through that discussions were just so interesting and then whenever I read her bio I'm like wait you're also a professor of history you have a whole yes. <laughs> like quote unquote real job I mean not that romance writing you know what I mean is a real job but you have like a professional other job outside of writing and your writing is still so good and so complex and readable like page turner you know so I, I just really am always impressed with her yeah. writing. Well, you've covered a wide range of topics for print and online publications as an essayist and journalist. Tell us about your writing journey. Like at what point in your life did you realize it was a passion of yours and it was something you wanted to pursue? Funny because I don't feel like there was ever a time where I said I'm going to be a writer because I've always written like as a kid I wrote, you know, little kid stories, but as a teenager I was very uh, impassioned about feminism and animal rights and various topics. And so I was writing letters to the editor. And now this is in the late, late 80s, early 90s. So I was snail mailing them to these publications. Oh, <laughs> but it was really cool because like my letters would be in the New York Times and in Vogue and in all these places. And they would call you because this is before email was super common. They would call you and say, can we publish this? 
And it was always so exciting. And I remember then I went to college. I graduated in high school in 1993. So I went to college and that was when I got my first email address. And I was a big 10,000 Maniacs fan. So you could pick your email address. So I was Maniac at my school. And then, so then it started, you could email the, um, you know, letters to the editor. And in college, I wrote an, I wrote an essay for Parade Magazine. Uh, and then I wrote one for the San Francisco Chronicle. So I was always writing. But like I said, that was nonfiction. Uh, erotica never occurred to me. Fiction never occurred to me until a few years later, I was in law school, which was not really working out. And I'd been reading a lot of erotica. And I thought, you know what, let me try this. And I did. And it was on a whim. And I was using the law school, you know, computer lab to print it out. And oh my I, gosh. Can't, I, I can't remember if I, if you had to snail mail it in or email it. But I do remember that first story I wrote got accepted. It was for a book called I can say a curse word, right? Yes, I, yes. I, th- I think so. I know it's a podcast, but I just like to ask. Uh, Starfucker was the name of the book, and that story got accepted, and that was so exciting to me. Like, to, I mean, I had I'd written these essays, and that was fun too. But to see my name in a book was it felt really different because I love books. They're the thing that I own the most of and the thing that I always, anytime I move, I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to give away any books. And it's a battle with my boyfriend because he's a minimalist and he's a writer too. But, you know, he doesn't need the physical copies. He mostly does ebooks. So I, I, I do both, but I love having physical books because I feel like if you own the literal copy you owned 20 years ago or however many years ago that you've lugged around and you've read this many times, it it becomes a part of you in a different way than an ebook. Not that I, not not knocking ebooks. I love ebooks too, but I think there's something about holding a book and maybe you're, you know, underlining something or you're putting tabs on it or you just remember the feeling of holding that book and you know which part of the book you know. You might not know the page number, but you know, okay, in the middle of this book, this thing happens, and I remember turning that page and I remember where I was when I read it. So to see my name in a book was super exciting, but. Even then, I didn't know this was going to be my career. That really just evolved over time. I I had other jobs. I I was in law school, and then I was doing admin jobs, and then I got a job at a magazine as an editor. So words at that point became more a part of my overall career, Uh, and then I was editing more anthologies, and then it just really just kept adding on, okay, I'm going to edit more anthologies. I'm going to write a sex column for the Village Voice. I'm going to write articles. And then I started teaching erotic writing classes. And not because anyone said to me, you should do this. I just, I was adding all this knowledge to my skill set from editing the anthologies. And I thought, there's got to be people who want to write erotica the way I did back when I started, but who want guidance. And really, I I mean, I I feel like I'm a good teacher, but I think even more than any techniques or tips that I give people, I think it's the permission and the encouragement to just go there and explore erotic thoughts and stories and and hear other people sharing them. There's still so much um, fear, I think, around writing these things down. People are afraid of being judged. They're afraid of what, the, what does it mean about me if I want to write about this thing? And I think there's something very powerful about being in a space, whether it's a virtual space or an in-person space, and hearing other people sharing their thoughts and, and just hearing their voice and knowing that they might be nervous too or they might be uncertain. I, I think having a validation from someone, and not just me, I don't think I'm the, I don't think I'm the only person who can validate that or say that's good or interesting, I think they get it from their fellow students too. That can be so just encouraging. And I think that can set people on a path to say, okay, I'm going to keep pursuing this. And some of them are doing it to try to get published, but some I think are just doing it for personal fulfillment, maybe to work out something in their own sex life or intimate life or to write to a lover or just to see what happens, like to see what comes out of their mind when they're in an space that, you know, they can be free to do that. That's a beautiful answer there. I I love that last part. Yeah. 
On your website, next to a gorgeous photo of you and a stack of erotica anthologies, you share that you've edited over 70 erotica anthologies. Please share with us your erotica origin story. Okay, so I shared my writing erotica story. This is my, I guess, editing erotica story. I'd been writing those short stories for a few years, and then I was asked to co-edit an anthology called Up All Night, which I think is out of print because the publisher eventually closed. But I've edited that with a woman named Stacey Bias, and those were true lesbian sex stories. And that was that came out in 2004. And I've definitely learned a lot about editing anthology since then. I, I can't remember exactly how we spread the word. I know Stacey had a website at the time called Technodike, so she posted the call for stories there, and I shared it among people I knew. Uh, but I feel like, in general, the pool of authors was mostly our social circles. And so that anthology went well. Um, and then I edited, co-edited a few more, and then I got asked to edit my own for various publishers. Now I mostly work with Cleus Press, and I uh, I edit two to three a year. Uh, most of them, I accept 20 to 25 stories. Sometimes I do flash fiction, which I'm, I have a call up right now. Those are shorter, 1,000 to 1,200 words, and I have room for 69 stories. And yes, that's on purpose. <laughs> um, but I found that I really liked editing, I, I think partly because writing is so solitary and you do it by yourself. I mean, maybe sometimes I do it at a coffee shop, but you're still in your head and you're not, it's not a collaborative process for me. It's very individual and I don't have co-authors. I, I don't have a beta reader, even though I encourage people to do it in my book, How to Write Erotica. But for me, writing is just a very solitary process, unless it's journalism where I'm interviewing people. But editing is really cool because I can have an idea like, oh, let's, uh, you know, this, the theme of play, like it is in Best Women's Erotic of the Year, Volume 8, or the theme is orgasms or oral sex or whatever. And I put it out there and now I put it out there online and anyone around the world could be reading it. And I get to read all these authors' takes on that topic that I came up with and that's really exciting because people have different writing styles. People have different life experiences. You know, someone who's, I don't know, like a farmer in Italy or something like that, or uh, whatever they do. I don't know, a tech person in Brazil. I don't know. You know, those are just hypotheticals, but they're going to have a different perspective on life or someone who, you know, was a virgin till age 40 in, in a more conservative culture and then I do, and they're just going to have a different outlook. And so I love seeing how different people approach the same topic. Sometimes they come up with things that were kind of on my general wish list of, I would love my book to have these things, but most often people send me stories that I would not have thought of. And that to me is really exciting. And I think that fulfills my social side. Like I like to just meet new people and I, I don't follow all the I've, uh, hundreds of people I've worked with because I've edited stories by almost 800 authors. But a lot of them I do follow online. A lot I've met in person at readings and events. And they do interesting things. Um, one of the women I published in uh, Best Women's Erotic of the Year, Volume 6, is a chef in Mexico. And she teaches cooking classes. And I took one of her cooking classes online. So I'm just exposed to so many different people and their lives and their um, journeys within erotica. Some are brand new to erotica. Sometimes I'm publishing their first short story or their first published story. That's always really gratifying to me as an editor. And I, I, like, I think it is a different skill set. Uh, sometimes people, I think, assume I'm just picking the 20 that I like the best. And it's not as simple as that because I'm picking stories that I like, but they're not all necessarily just my personal taste. I'm trying to think about what would readers of erotica, you know, think? What would avid readers who've read tons of erotica think? And then also, what would people who've never read erotica, who are picking this up for the first time, think? And I want to be welcoming to both of those groups. I don't want it to be so, I don't know if edgy is the right word, but so um, 
obscure or in depth with a kink that it uses jargon that someone wouldn't understand and would feel like, oh, this is not for me. But I also don't want people who are immersed in the erotica world to feel like, oh, I've already read this. Yeah. So that that's the challenging thing even now that I've done it so many times. It's always challenging because uh, there's just a lot to to balance within a given word count. Well, I have a couple of questions that I want to make sure that we I, I, like I throw in there before I forget. So you mentioned reading erotica in law school. Was that your like how you got exposed to it? Like, do you remember yep. the first time you read something that was erotica? I don't know if this was the very first. I think it was. I do remember there was a feminist bookstore in Oakland, California called Mama Bears, which I don't think exists anymore, but they had an erotica section. And I thought, this is so cool. I'm going to, you know, pick some of these up. And they were short story anthologies. And there were two called Virgin Territory and Virgin Territory 2 that were edited by Shara Rednauer, who's the editor I worked with on that Starfucker story later. But they were true stories. And I I remember devouring them. And I, those are books I still own. They're very dog-eared. And they were so interesting because they were true stories. They just had details that I feel like you wouldn't write in the exact same way if you were writing fiction. They just, the authors really set these scenes of, of range of erotic experiences that real women had gone through. And those were really powerful to me. And I thought, this is interesting. And then at the same time, around the same time, I was exploring my own bisexuality and that was new to me. So for me, my personal sexual journey coincided with my discovering erotica. And that was around age 20, 19 or so. So that those are kind of combined. And uh, I, I think that led me to more erotica. And it w- wasn't something I'd been exposed to, even though I read romance in high school. I read Danielle Steele and Judith Kranz and some of these kind of soapy authors. And I read some lesbian romance, uh, I guess what you'd call mainstream, like contemporary romances. But I feel like with those, there were sex scenes, but they 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 weren't what we'd call erotic romance now. They, that The sex scenes weren't as explicit, certainly, as a lot of what you see now uh, in in the same sections of the bookstore. So that erotica was really where I was exposed to explicit sex writing, uh, that the, the, the heart of it was the sexuality part. And that appealed to me. Uh, and I, I, it's funny because I don't know what exactly led me to think I'm going to try to write this myself, but I thought, oh, I'll try it. And if it works, okay. And if it doesn't, okay. But I, I guess I just had things to say about sex. The, the first stories I wrote were either autobiographical or lightly veiled autobiographical or about fantasies that I had. And I think for me as an author, where I had to push myself was when I started writing stories that were about characters who were not like me and that weren't drawn from my life. I had to really go more into the fiction part of erotic fiction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I had one more that I wanted to throw in there. So I have this like I came to reading romance and erotica late. So like 2017 ish about to turn 30. Tell us what the world of erotica looked like when you were entering it. Like I just have this idea of like, if I go to Barnes and Noble, I don't see an erotica section Mm -hmm. even to this day. So I, I have this assumption that like in the nineties, when you would have been like graduating high school and like in college, like it was probably I have this assumption that it was even more hidden, even more hard to find. Actually, um, so what? What? Tell us what it looked like. What? Like what me, it actually was. For me, it was the opposite because at the time, I, I don't remember if there was online shopping, but I was shopping in store in bookstores, and I was finding erotica in E. Dalton and Borders. And that's awesome. There were okay. I don't know if there were whole sections, but there were end caps with. Books like, I don't know if it was this exact book, but like Man with a Maid, there was this line of, a lot of them were written by quote unquote anonymous. Um, And they were as explicit as anything you would find. I mean, they were erotica, like full out erotica. And I was seeing them in mainstream bookstores. I don't know if 
they were exactly in an erotic section, but they weren't hidden. Like they weren't tucked away. I think it's much harder to find erotica in either like a Barnes and Noble now or independent bookstores. And I almost always go to a bookstore if I'm in a town. That's the first thing I look up. It's like, does this town have a cool bookstore? Because where I live, it's kind of a bookstore wasteland. There's there's a books a million nearby and they just have, they don't really have the selection that I'm looking for. Like they have some, they have a decent romance. I'll give them that, but they just don't have the, the breadth I'd be looking for. But so when I go to independent bookstores, for the most part, unless they're a romance bookstore or unless they've gone out of their way to curate some erotica, I might find nothing or I might find Fifty Shades of Grey and the story of O. Oh, I'm not finding Katrina Jackson. I'm not finding, uh, you know, my books. I'm not finding, um, you know, other widely published erotica. Uh, I, I actually think for mainstream publishing, there's less now than there was because in the 90s and 2000s, there was Best American Erotica series from Simon and Schuster, and that has shuttered. And there'll be there'll be one-offs, like there'll be occasional erotica. Um, anthologies, their erotic novels, but there there aren't as many as erotica sections as you would think there would be, especially since Fifty Shades. I've been surprised. I think romance has gotten a lot spicier. Sexier, yeah. I don't love the name spicy. Like to me, it, it kind of feels not that sexy. Of a yeah. word. <laughs> like I understand why it exists, and I understand. I'm not against using a categorization system to give people a sense of what's in a book but I just to me spicy just feels like a weird word but I, and it's I so do, subjective right like spicy yeah. for me could be totally different spicy yeah. for you, you but, <laughs> but okay since we all know what spicy means in this context I think mainstream erotica I mean mainstream romance has gotten a lot spicier there are handcuffs on book covers there's anal sex and threesomes and there are things that I wasn't seeing in the bookstore when I was in high school and I was going to Walden Books that was the bookstore at the time you know I I went from reading Sweet Valley High to reading you know Jackie Collins and those kinds of books uh I mean I'm sure there was erotic content being published but um so so then then later when I was a little bit older there were these erotica imprints um Blue Moon and uh, there were smaller publishers putting out erotica that was getting into these mainstream bookstores that those publishers don't exist. And publishers like mine, like Cleus Press, um, Bold Strokes Books. I mean, I see Bold Strokes Books in mainstream bookstores, but I don't see an erotica section it, for them. You know, like they're, they're an LGBTQ publisher. And so I see their books in that section. I, I'd be very curious if a mainstream bookstore, whether an indie or a um, like a Barnes and Noble type store made an erotica section, how it would do. And I suspect it would do well. Now, I think for some people, they don't want to shop in a bookstore for erotica because they don't want people to see them. They don't want to deal with the cashier. They would rather buy them as ebooks or audiobooks so that, you know, no one has to see a physical object. You know, maybe they have kids, maybe they have a spouse or people in their home that's they just want the privacy of that. I totally get that. But I think it's a real missed business opportunity to not have any erotica, even a small shelf of it. I, I I continue to not really understand that. I don't know if it's that bookstores think people will be offended or what, but considering how explicitly sexual a lot of modern romance is, I think by default, that means that there's also an audience for explicit erotica. So I think it's thriving in ebooks. I think it's thriving in self-publishing. It's definitely thriving in audio. Uh, and I don't know quite why more mainstream publishing hasn't picked up on that and, and mainstream on it, yeah. bookstores. But, you know, I, I'm, I, I don't, I don't know, but I think it's great that there is more room for alternative sexuality in erotica and romance. And then I think, you know, the fact that a happily ever after could be three people now, or it can be, you know, kinky, and it, it's not looked at as that weird. Now, that being said, we're still, we still slut shame in fiction. I, I had, ju I just interviewed an author, and this is not about erotica, but uh, Taylor Hahn wrote this novel about swinging. And it's a 
mainstream fiction novel. It's some, it's a, it's, ro- there's romantic elements, but it's not necessarily a romance. But she said that a Goodreads reviewer called her main character a whore. And, you know, she got some pushback and hate because her characters were swingers. And this is, that book came out last year. So I think we still have a ways to go. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask this next one. And then I know Aaron has a really interesting question that we would love to get your perspective on since we've been talking about spicy, you know, how the mm-hmm. categorization of it. If, if anyone is yet to read an erotica or if they're unsure if they have, how would you describe it to them? Well, the definition I use with my students is writing intended to arouse. And so there could be erotic elements in other kinds of fiction. Uh, I think, you know, there, there are erotic elements in a lot of romance. I think the difference really, the ba- most basic difference between romance and erotic is that in romance, you're always going to have that happily ever after or happily for now. Whereas in erotica, you might have that kind of connection with another character, but the characters might wind up single or the the focus of the journey is their erotic and sexual uh, path and journey and discovery. And that might coincide with a romantic or other kind of relationship. You know, it might also be an emotional relationship along with the sexual connection, but it also could be someone having sex with a stranger. I have a book called Sexy Strangers coming out later this year. Uh, It could be that. And that, that is complete in and of itself. As long as there's, the eroticism that a reader would be looking for. So, you know, I I think some of it is marketing, you know, some of it, I think a lot of erotic romance, erotica readers would also enjoy, but romance readers would too, if they want explicitly sexual romance. But to me, I like that broad definition, because that means that there could be erotic elements in mainstream fiction. And there's, there's sometimes I'll pick up a book, and there's, a shockingly sexy scene. And I love that experience of not expecting it in a, in a non erotic, you know, just general fiction book and finding it. And there's a great book called a concise Chinese English dictionary for lovers. The author's name is X I A L O U G U O. And I don't know how to pronounce it, which is why I spelled it out, but it's about this woman who comes from rural China to London and is learning English throughout the course of the novel. So in the beginning, her English is not as uh, proficient as it will be later on. And there's a scene where she goes to a peep show, and it's so erotic because she's looking at these other women and thinking about her own sexuality and, and being turned on by it and just the exhibitionism and voyeurism. And it's so powerful. And it's, you know, it's, it's not an erotic novel, I'm not going to say that, but it's definitely a fascinating novel. And that scene stood out to me. I think sometimes erotic scenes can stand out when they're set against a non-erotic rest of a plot. Well, let me ask you about the just the word smut. So mm-hmm. romance in general by, by, some, uh, by some people could just generally be called smut um mm-hmm. you know my, my partner could even joke with me as so, you know uh, oh you're reading your smut and not you know i'll just be like oh yeah you know me and, and it, it could just be a regular romance novel and you know between us it's all good fun but what i you know i myself as a romance and erotica reader wouldn't call either of them uh smut whether mm-hmm. it's mainstream romance or erotica what what do you think what sorry I can actually take this because if, if you, I think I know you're asking, like, do I find the word smut offensive in this context? Is that what you're asking? Uh, kind of, kind of. But uh, I guess what, uh, how it's just you... so used so widely now to kind mm-hmm. of describe books yeah, that like, are like, spicier yeah, and then kind of like spicy. And then yeah. it's just meaningless. It's been interesting. I actually, it's funny you should ask that because I've been tinkering with an article idea about this use of smut because you see it a lot on TikTok. You see it on Instagram. I see it in mainstream articles. And I I do think smut has become this catch-all phrase for any sex in romance. And people say, you know, I'm reading my smutty romance. And, you know, I don't, that might have a lot of dirty sex in it. But then again, what what does dirty mean? I, I think you're right, Bri, that it's very subjective. And one person's smut could be another person's something super tame 
and you know some i mean there's such a wide range of sex that people could be having in real life and in romance and some people are looking for you know very explicit and kinky and even within that there you know there's levels right and, and some people just have specific fetishes like they want this kind of story about this kind of sex with this kind of pairing and then some people just want hot sex scenes uh they don't care as much who's doing them or what's happening within them as long as they find it arousing so uh you know i think smut has become this easy shorthand and some people use it pejoratively especially outside of romance or or just to sort of say okay well this is more highbrow on some level over here and over there is smut but then i think on places like TikTok, people are using it in the opposite way. They're like, yes, bring on the smut. I want all the smut. And there's a lot of, you know, money book club and smut proud smut reader, smut proud smut author. I have a, t- a t-shirt that I bought that I think it says like proud smut reader from someone on Instagram who I'm sorry, I don't remember who that is credited to. I, I think it has become a buzzword. And I would say over the last three to five years. I don't, it definitely was not a word that was popping up when I was starting 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Maybe people were using it, but now it's everywhere. And I think that's interesting. I don't know if people don't like the word erotica, like if erotica feels too fancy and smut is just down and dirty to describe what they're we're trying to describe it as. Uh, but in general, I feel like it's almost like uh, the phrase guilty pleasure like, wh- why do we need that term? Why should someone feel right, guilty right. about what they're reading? And not not that we can't use smut. I, I think guilty pleasure is worse than smut as a phrase to judge someone's reading. But I just feel like in general, why are you judging what anyone else is reading anyway? I'm just happy people are reading when there's so many other things that they could do. And, you know, I watch Netflix. I watch shows. Like, I, I do other activities too. But I feel like in a time when, you know, there's so many other forms of entertainment competing for people's attention. Let people read what they want and don't judge them for it. And, you know, I, I've seen it within, you know, my family or friends or and around, not just around romance. Like I read cozy mysteries and sometimes we're like, Oh, why, why are you reading that? Like, why don't you read a more complex or literary book? And, you know, I, it's not like you can only read one thing. And also, so what if you want to, like some people, that's, they only want to read cozy mysteries or they only want to read smutty, spicy romance. And that's fine. Those are both equally fine than someone who reads 10 different genres. Well, the theme of our most recent Best Women's Erotic Anthology is play. <laughs> what is the process of coming up with the themes for the collections? Is that all on you or, or what? That's on me. Um, the first two books in Best Women's Erotic of the Year, there was no theme. And to help me have a sense of, you know, whether a story worked or not, and also to give readers a little bit of a a sense of what to expect, I decided to make themes. But I wanted the themes to be broad enough that almost anything could fit within that if you can figure out how to do it. Maybe not anything, but a wide range of things. I didn't want the theme to be, like, really specific, like, um, you know, this kind of fetish, because then it is harder to differentiate among 20 different stories, they can start to feel monotonous. So a theme like play, I I felt like could be so many things. It could be sports, which I didn't get. I don't, there's no sports stories in the book. And I don't think I got a lot of submissions with sports, but there's LARPing. um, There's like a sexy card game. There's all, there's music, playing music. And there's like a literal, oh my God. Um, We're going to play a game during the theater at the theater as a play is going on. (laughs) I love that one. Me too. (laughs) I I think it's one of those themes that I I try to make themes that, you know, yes, people are writing to this specific book and there's a deadline and then I pick the stories, but you could also take that theme and keep going with it, you know, in your writing separately from this book because play is such a, of all encompassing term. I mean, it could be BDSM play. People use play within the context of sex, but you know, you could play with food. You could play with, um, I don't know, I guess drag racing could be playing in yeah. some way. Rilsey you know, Adams is, is two musicians, you know, getting ready to play. <laughs> yes. And like, so I like a word that 
can signify lots of different things. I, I've done surprise, I've done outrageous, I've done risk. Um, so the, the themes that I look for for this series are usually a word or phrase that really an author can take and and adapt it to whatever they want to fit in somehow. I, mainly, I don't want readers to feel like, oh, these stories you know, are, are all about the same type of character and the same type of story. So, so I wanted to find aspects of play that varied in, in ways that w- would keep readers reading. And I don't know if most people read straight through or if people jump around. I'm definitely a jump around reader with an anthology. I will read either a story by a, an author I know and know I want to read, you know, that I'm probably going to like their work or if a title catches my eye I will read that first so I'm an out of order type of reader uh but you know I I make the anthology table of contents one that if you were reading straight through hopefully you would be taken on kind of a journey and um it's not so much oh there's more explicit sex here and less explicit sex here just it's a variety so these books the best ones erotic of the year series they're pansexual so there are um, straight, lesbian, bisexual characters and and people in relationships, people who are single, um, two partners, multiple partners. There, there's a lot of variety in each of the books. And so I try to make it one where if you were reading straight through, you would be taken to different kinds of settings. So there's sci-fi in this book. There's a drag show. There's that musical performance. There's uh the LARPing, there's vacations, there's fetishes, and just all sorts of different um, approaches. And sometimes uh, when people, like, I think they think I have some secret formula, and they'll say, well, I read your guidelines, but is there anything you really want to see that you didn't put in the guidelines? And no, there's not anything I can say, okay, definitely write me this kind of story, because you know, yeah, and the play in this book, I would have loved the sports story. I still would love some sports erotica because I don't receive that much of it. But I'm just kind of, I, I go in with an open mind. And so I look at what comes in and I I might towards the end of the process, like if my, like for instance, this one, the deadline for the next, for volume 10, because volume nine is already locked in. Uh, for volume 10, the deadline is July 1st, 2023. If in May, I start to notice that I have all, let's say, heterosexual stories. I will probably go update my guidelines and say, hey, I have a huge number of heterosexual stories. I want bisexual stories. I want lesbian stories. I want stories with trans women or or whatever I feel like is missing. I will try to nudge people in that direction. But I am just always open to authors' ideas. Well, on Frolic's website a couple of years ago, you shared five elements that you look for when you're selecting stories. So you are looking for surprise, memorable characters, diversity, real life elements, and sexual variety. Do you have any advice for anyone who may be listening and wanting to submit to ensure they've captured these in their submission? I don't know if I have specific advice on how to do that. I will say I'm not necessarily looking for all five of those things in every single story. That is more the overall thing I'm trying to do with the book as a whole. So, you know, like real life elements, I've published stories where there's characters overcoming sexual abuse and then exploring their sexuality post that abuse. I've, I've had stories about mental health where people are, they're, uh, you know, working on issues around body image or around uh, agoraphobia and other mental health issues. I've published stories about uh, people grappling with divorce or end of a relationship or or a death in their life and how sex impacts that. So when I say real life elements, I mean, that could be anything. It could be someone losing their job. I'm less interested in COVID stories. I got a lot of those in 2020 and I mostly shied away from them because that situation was changing so much. But I did publish uh, one or two maybe, maybe more, but I definitely published some social distancing type stories where people were webcamming. Uh, I think it's it's tough because there's about a year lead time, sometimes a year and a half with my book. So 
you know, if it's something very timely now, it may not be timely a year, year and a half from now. But overall, I would say, don't try to write what you think I want to read, write what you want to read or write what you think is sexy. And then you can always edit it afterwards. You know, don't try to like, just like, pop some aliens into your story or, or add something really outlandish because you think it'll make it stand out. I, you know, you can write aliens or you can write whatever outlandish thing you want to write, but don't force it. I, I always say like, you can write about people having the most seemingly normal sex. I don't believe in that, but I'm just saying like normal in the sense of, you know, it's a, let's say it's a, a married couple and they're having um, you know, just whatever you think of the most basic sex act is with the lights out and under the covers and, you know, at night, like, in, you know, nothing unusual about it. But if, if you can capture their emotional intimacy and their physical intimacy and the connection between them and why this moment is so special, even if it seems, you know, basic or whatever phrase you want to use there, then I, I would totally be open to publishing that. Like maybe they're doing that, but they're talking so dirty about really, you know, things that push each of their buttons. Uh, or maybe it's three people, you know, maybe it's not like the, you know, maybe it's a threesome, but like they're hiding under the covers because I don't know, someone's across the hall and they don't want people to know. So I'm open to anything. And within the guidelines I have, which are, there's very few things I don't publish. Like I, I publish all characters 18 or over. Everything has to be consensual. But within that, I'm looking for anything. And I love to be surprised because I've been doing this so long. I've published, I don't know exactly how many stories, but probably thousands. So, And I've definitely read thousands. So anything that captures my attention right away and makes me want to keep reading and like makes me think about that story after I'm done and makes me want to read it again. That those are the kind of stories that will go in my yes pile. Well, I had, I had one that, uh, that popped into my head. Uh, so a quick Google shows me that there, there, at least since 2014, hasn't been a best men's erotica series. Mm. Have you, do you get submission from men and what would you say is the biggest overall difference between erotica written by men versus women? That's a good question. So for the best women's erotica of the year series, it is limited to authors who are identified as women or non-binary or gender non-conforming, gender queer. But in my other anthologies, I've worked with authors of all genders. I don't really think I can generalize too much. Uh, I, I definitely get the most submissions from women authors. I don't know if that's because there's more women writing erotica or I'm a woman or, you know, just that's like a self-perpetuating cycle. But there's definitely men writing really hot erotica, usually from a male point of view. There's men writing straight male erotica, bisexual erotica, gay male erotica. And, you know, I, I don't think gender limits you in any way to what you can write. I think maybe where some male authors, especially straight male authors, get I mean is that they are not as used to thinking about sex in the way that good erotica wants you to think about sex. I, I think in our culture, women are the ones who are taught to kind of obsess about sex and like, you know, what, where do I put, like, how do I look the best during sex? And w what can I do that's going to make me attractive, but not too slutty. And like, there's just so many messages that women get about sex and how to do it and like look sexy and feel sexy and be sexy and but but not be you know too far in that direction so I think because we're so inundated with that uh women tend to want to process some of those feelings into erotica and I don't think men are cultured most men in our society are, are brought up to think that way about sex I think the way we're we still treat sex in our culture is from, for straight men anyway, is like, oh, sex is something to like get from women. And, and we don't encourage men to think about it as more of a mutual exchange. I'm not saying all men think this way. I'm saying that's still out there in our culture. And I think for erotica to work, you have to dig into the emotional side of it along with the physical side of it. And it's not really so much about getting to the point of having sex. It's, it's what 
sex means to their life. And, you know, not just, okay, I'm doing this exciting thing, but like, how does it feel emotionally, physically, mentally, you know, what, what is so important about the sex that, that you're telling the story. And I think that can sometimes trip up some male authors. I think sometimes they focus more on the physical, like I do sometimes see, okay, breast size or like sort of the way bodies are written. I, I'm sure you've probably seen on Twitter, these things go around where they're just the most ridiculous descriptions of women's bodies by male authors that would just never, a woman would never describe herself that way. So I think if you are not sure if your erotica works and you're writing, you're a man writing about women, especially like run that by some women in your life and see if they note any red flags. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was a good question. (laughs) Well, I mean, since you began your journey in the world of erotica, do you feel like it's evolved and, and how so? I think the biggest thing has been the expansion of the market. Yes, there are fewer of the publishers I was talking about that I came up with that I was reading early on, but now there is self-publishing, there are like smaller ebook imprints, there, there's always opportunities, and then there's opportunities beyond book publishing. There's uh, apps, there's audio apps, there's Medium and other sites where you can publish erotica and in real time see how people are reacting. Like you can very quickly see, okay, this one has this many readers, this one has that many readers, you know, or people are getting to you via this search or people are commenting about this. So I think the data and and just customer feedback is, or reader feedback is so much uh, more robust now than it was before the internet or before the prominence of the internet where you were relying on book sale numbers or, you know, sale mail from, or emails from readers. I think now you, you know, people use social media, they can, you know, you could start a Twitter account that's just erotica and be tweeting it out and seeing what, what hits and what doesn't. Uh, So I think that's really just changed things because there's lots of people publishing, self-publishing erotica that, you know, they can do very well and be very successful there, even if they're writing about topics that most mainstream publishers wouldn't touch. And then there's, there's Amazon, there's sites like Smashwords, where people are publishing erotica that is too, quote, unquote, taboo for Amazon. I do think it's interesting how Amazon definitely polices erotica in ways that I don't think are, are really fitting to the market. There's lots of things that people want to read about that they either won't publish or they, they are touchy about. Uh, and so in sort of, in, in the way similar to how you know, Barnes and Noble isn't stocking erotica and how Instagram won't let you show nipples. And there's, there's, I do think there's been a sort of conservative backlash from the tech industry as a whole against sexuality, which has impacted erotica publishing. But I think that's also created a market or, or revived the market for it. I, if you have a fetish and you want to read about that in erotica, you're going to find it. You're going to seek it out. And I think smart authors have capitalized on that and have found those niches. And I, I think it's easier probably now to find the erotica you're looking for, especially if you have a really specific interest, because you can just search for it and you know maybe you'll find a Reddit thread or a Reddit, you know, subreddit about it or a community about it, or maybe you'll find ebooks or, you know, niche publications or audio. Uh, erotic audio is really thriving. There's a lot of apps and I predict there, there will be more and more coming because that's how a lot of people consume things now. Yeah. 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 Well, is there anything you can share with us about Best Women's Erotica Volume 9? Um, well, I can tell you it's coming out this December. Honestly, my brain is a little overloaded. I'm going to have to look up. I'm like, what is the theme of this? <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. I should know because I edited it. But I, so part of You're the, busy. You're a busy uh, person. Okay. The like, blessing <laughs> and the curse of what I do is that I am working on multiple books at the same time. Like I'm promoting Best Women's Erotic of the Year 8. I have three erotica anthologies coming out this year with Best Women's Erotica of the Year in December. And then I'm also editing two new ones to come out next year. 
So like my focus has to constantly shift from, you know, current editing, like looking at submissions to thinking about what's coming out next. So uh, I can tell you, I was excited to work with some authors whose work I've read and enjoyed, Ruby Barrett, uh, Carmen Lee, and I, there's there's definitely lots of great queer stories by those two in particular and other authors that I'm always really excited to bring a mix of uh, female, 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 male, you know, bisexual, just a range of sexualities to the series, especially for readers who are maybe used to reading uh, heterosexual erotica. I, I think that they, some of them only want to read that, but some of them I think enjoy the mix. So, uh, and I enjoy offering that mix to to readers. I don't expect every reader to like every story because that's just not how people's minds always work. But yeah. I, I think if you're open-minded, you might discover something that you didn't know you liked. And I am not a sci-fi reader. I have tried, like in general, I've tried to read sci-fi. For the most part, I don't read it because I just, I can't get into it. But when an author can make me get into it or can, you know, shift my mind in that direction, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So there's an outer space erotica story in volume nine that's fun. Uh, the theme is temptation, and that was another broad theme that I thought could fit lots of different scenarios. So, you know, and, and also I think the other thing with the themes is that they're subjective. So what's tempting to one person might be off-putting to another, or what, what might seem tempting or wild to one person might seem totally blasé to another. And I like to give readers a range of characters who who run the gamut of those kinds of experiences. Yeah. So one of so the yeah, things so, that's like so cool about these is like you just kind of the discoverability, like you said, like um, for one, you you go into these not really knowing who's writing, who like what to expect, right? And like I remember the first collection that I read, I think the first story or one of the first stories was by Naima Simone and it was like at a tattoo oh, yeah. convention. It was hands down one of the best things I've ever read. Still one of my favorite stories that of all time. Called, that story, I just want to shout it out. It's called Inked on My Skin. Yes. I, I think it's in <laughs> Best Women's Erotic of the Year, Volume 6. Naima is one of my favorite authors. I love her sex scenes. I love her writing. I'm a huge fan. And that story is another one that is, there is an emotionally complex and kind of dark plot line to it. There's like a trauma that has happened within the character's stories but then they the you know the sex isn't like oh the sex is going to solve their whole life it's just that through the course of what happens in the story they do have hot sex and the characters have these interesting backstories and you know I would read a whole novel about them I would I would read a whole novel about anything she wanted to write because I, <laughs> I love her writing but but thank you I I'm really proud of that volume in particular yeah, it was so good. And then, of course, I mean, volume seven, which is like banger after banger, like so many good authors. And then like authors that like you haven't heard of before. And it's like, OK, I want I'm going to watch out for this person now. So I think that's just what makes it so fun. I mean, in this one, like I didn't for, first of all, like it's blurbed by Katrina Jackson. And then Rilsey Adams has the first story. Eva Lee has the second one. And I was like, I never would have thought of these two in this collection. I mean, and I've read Rilsey. Her stuff is super sexy. I've read Eva. Her stuff is super sexy. And it was just like a proud moment of like, oh my gosh, they're writing erotica for me. <laughs> oh, I love that. I mean, yeah. my, to me, a huge compliment would be if someone reads an author in this series and then goes on to read their other work. Because yeah. a lot of them, I mean, I put on the call for submissions and mostly authors send me their work, but there are authors who I'm a fan of and I will reach out to them and say, hey, I'm a fan of your work. If you were interested in writing an erotic story or an erotic romance, like I would love to consider it. And that's how some of these authors came to be in the book, like Fiona Zetti, uh, Rosanna Leo, Christina Berry. This is volume eight. Uh, Robin Lovett, who who also writes amazing sci-fi erotica. And I will read her Aliens because uh, somehow I can get into those and, and Rilsey Adams. So uh, you know, I, I'm on Twitter a lot and I'm on romance Twitter a lot. And that is where I get probably the vast majority of the recommendations of authors I read. I'm pretty sure I discovered Katrina Jackson, Naima Simone, Rosie Adams, uh, 
the authors I just said on Twitter, just from seeing people post about them. And I love that it's such a supportive community. So even though my books are not romance per se, I have published a lot of romance authors. I've published Sierra Simone, uh, C.D. Rice, uh, just, you know, Alyssa Cole. And I, I think, I think for them, it gives them an outlet to write like the spiciest version of, or, or, you know, a spicy version, a sexy, explicitly erotic take on what could be a romance or could be erotic romance. Like I don't, I, my stories sometimes blur that line and that's fine. Like if you read erotic romance, I think you'll like my books. And if you read erotica and, but don't read erotic romance, I think you'll like the erotic romance stories in my Mm -hmm. book. Well, um, how to write erotica is out. Plug it again. Where can people get it, find it, you know, plug how to write erotica. How to write erotica is a, writing guide for people who uh, either have no experience writing erotica or maybe you have some, but it's intended for beginners. And there are lots of writing prompts. There are interviews with people like Katrina Jackson, Sally Ben, uh, authors who are self-published, who are traditionally published, who run the gamut, uh, male authors, female authors, trans authors. Uh, there's an interview with a beta reader. There's an interview with a sensitivity reader. There's tips on submitting your work. And this is, again, one you could read straight through or you could jump around. And I, I hope it's the kind of book people will keep on their bookshelf and, you know, return to over and over because there's there's just a lot of information in it. I don't, it's, it's too, too much to absorb. It's not really the type of book you just sit and read. It's, it's like you read a little and then you hopefully write. Like, I hope people read it and then get inspired to write. Uh, and so it is out now in print and ebook wherever you buy books and there will be an audiobook down the road. I don't know exactly when, but hopefully in the next few months. Yes. Okay. Yes. Amazing. Well, lastly, where can everyone keep up with you online? The place I'm at the most is Twitter. I'm at Raquelita, R-A-Q-U-E-L-I-T-A. I picked that. That was my nickname in Spanish class in high school and my full name did not fit on Twitter. I'm also online, Rachel Kramer Bustle on Instagram. My website is rachelkramerbustle.com. My Substack is rachelkramerbustle.substack.com, where I'm going to be sharing lots of writing tips and essays and articles and stories. Uh, and I also teach erotica classes uh, and essay classes now. That's all on my website, rachelkramerbustle.com. Also, Best Women's Erotica, you can find the guidelines for volume 10 at bwoftheyear.com. You can find my slash fiction erotica guidelines at rachelkramerbustle.com and the call for submission section and uh, also BW of the Year on Twitter and Best Women's Erotica on Instagram. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been like a dream. <laughs> thank you for hanging out it's with us today. Terrible. and. Yeah. I mean, you, you'll you be editing more anthologies and um, we have a podcast and we would love to talk to you again. So you'll have to come back. Awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's so fun.